Thank you for joining us today at Discovery Park of America. I'm Katie Jarvis from Discovery Park of America here in Union City, Tennessee. I will be your host for this and other lessons with professors from the University of Tennessee at Martin. These lessons are for students in grades six through nine, but they will be of interest to anyone. Today, we are with Dr. Lionel Cruz, an associate professor of physics at UT Martin. His lesson today will enlighten us on how stars are born. Dr. Cruz, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, no problem. I, I love doing this sort of thing, so. Well, we are so excited. And I couldn't help but think about um, A Star is Born, which is that movie with um, Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. So that's not what we're talking about today though, right? A little bit different. A little okay. Bit different. okay, well, you take it away. Okay, um, can I go ahead and share my absolutely. screen? Absolutely, absolutely, okay. share your screen with us. Because astronomy really is um, done with pictures. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that's one thing. That's one thing we have different about some of the other sciences. The other sciences, you have a lab, mm -hmm. and you like pour chemicals or look at rocks or you know whatever. In astronomy, we have pictures, right? Because mm -hmm. we can't grab a star or a planet or something and bring it down to the classroom and poke it with a thermometer. Mm -hmm. We have to look at the pictures. And so uh, when we look up in the sky, this is the kind of thing we see here. Um, this is actually a picture of a castle in uh, uh, near uh, Devon and Cornwall in England. And um, so it, it's one of those neat castles where the tides, as they come in and out, when, when the tides are out, you can actually walk to the castle. But when the tides are in, it's completely underwater. Oh, wow. So it's a neat place. Um, but when we look up in the sky, we see things like this. We see uh, this is the Milky Way, right? Um, and unfortunately, people that live in places that have uh, near, near a city can't see this very well, so you have to go out in the country and see it. Um, but you'll see all these stars. This is actually Jupiter over here. Oh, wow, it's and, very bright. Yeah, Ju Jupiter is actually, on average, the brightest planet. Venus gets a little bit brighter from time to time, but Jupiter's on average the brightest planet. You even see a meteor over here, right? So this is basically a pebble-sized rock streaking through the atmosphere and sort of burning up in the atmosphere as it goes. Um, and so the, the question becomes is, where does all this come from, right? Where, where, where are these stars being born? Uh, even the planets themselves, where is all that coming from? And so to do that, we have to look in different places in the sky. So one of the things we might see is something like this. Uh, this is called a nebula, um, or in, in astronomers, we call them clouds, because that's basically what they are. They're big uh, conglomerations of gas and what astronomers call dust. Right? Dust basically means little tiny grains. It's not the same thing as like if you're having to clean your room, that's a little bit different. This is actually more kind of like smoke. Um, but these are, this is called a nebula and we see these things and we notice that there's all this, you know, reddish clouds. Like we, that's we, kind, we, of, kind of spooky looking. Yeah, th th this is actually called the rosette nebula, which Ooh. basically means rose. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we see all this red glow here. We see these sort of filaments of, of, of dark clumps. And we even see this sort of gap in the center that has all these stars in it. And so what we realize is that what's actually going on here when we study this in more detail is stars are actually being born inside this cloud. That's what's actually happening right here. Mm -hmm. This is a so-called cluster of stars that has been born inside a gigantic cloud and the heat from those stars is actually making the cloud glow. Wow. That's what you're actually seeing. You know, it's just like you put a piece of metal in a hot fire, it'll start to glow. Same sort of process that's going on here. Except in this case, it's stars. Um, we also see just absolutely beautiful things like this. This is called the bubble nebula. Mm -hmm. And it's also a very similar thing. You have this uh, star here. This is actually uh, the star. And it's, it's actually creating a shock wave of heat. That's this bubble shape uh, through this bigger cloud. Right? You see, and it, and it just, just these really sort of fantastic views of, of you know, again, these things are absolutely enormous, much, much bigger than our solar system. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when we look at these nebula, it looks a little bit more crazy. Yeah, right? that looks yeah. like moss almost. <laughs> this is called the Crab Nebula. You can actually see this one with your, uh, without a telescope. It's, it looks just like a star though. I have to zoom in to see this. But the interesting thing here is, you know, it looks a lot more disjointed and crazy. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out if you look at Chinese records from 1054 AD, they actually talk about a new, a new star that you could see in the sky that they had never seen before. Mm -hmm. And when we look where they recorded that star, we see this. 
Wow. So what actually happened about a thousand years ago is the star exploded and made this gigantic thing right here. Hmm. And so we see this, you know, connection between these gigantic clouds of gas and dust in both stars being born and actually stars dying. Mm -hmm. And of course, just like anything else, when things die, they provide material for new generations to be born. Mm -hmm. right? And so there's this definite connection that we see between all these clouds. So I, I have a question sure, right yeah. off the bat. <laughs> so this, does this nebula, the Crab Nebula, stay in the same spot in uh, outer space in, or does it move or? It, it would slowly drift, but you would never notice it over okay. a human lifetime or even a civilization's lifetime. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's moving through space and not exactly at the same speed, exactly the same direction we're moving. So that'll make it kind of drift away or toward us. I don't, I don't know ex which one it is. Um, but it's very, very, very slowly. Very and can slowly. you give us just a smidge of history on the Hubble telescope? Because that's, is that who took the photo? And, and actually, that's a great question. I meant to mention this. Um, any picture on here that doesn't have an attribution is going to be a Hubble Space Telescope photograph. So some of them have it as well. But if you see a picture that doesn't have that, it's a Hubble's. Okay. I, I didn't want anybody to think I, that these were my pictures. Or yeah. <laughs> Um, of course, all the NASA Hubble pictures are all public domain, right. uh, so they're all over the place, easy to find. But yeah, this is the, the Hubble Space Telescope. It went up in the 80s, mm -hmm. and um, it uh, um, actually, I guess it was supposed to go up in the 80s, but then it went up later because of the Challenger explosion, now mm -hmm. that I, I'm, my, my brain is processing all of this. Mm -hmm. And it's been up there now for, you know, more than 20 years. It's, it's expected to last another decade or so before it finally runs out of juice. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've already got a replacement plan for it. Is that one called the Hubble Telescope too? <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually called the James Webb Space Telescope after the guy who was the director of NASA during the Apollo program. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. That's so yeah. neat. And it's a lot bigger. <laughs> um, so it, it'll be really, really cool when that thing goes up. I mean, these photographs are amazing here. Just imagine. Incredible. You know, yeah. yeah. With the technology that we have now at our, at our <laughs> hands. It's going to be amazing because this, I mean, this photo is just impressive and the other ones that you've already shown us are already really cool. So it's going to be, be neat. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the main missions of the James Webb Space Telescope will be looking at star and planet formation. Neat. It's specifically designed for that sort of thing. Wow. So um, we also see things like this. So the ones I showed you before were kind of reddish in color. This one's actually blue. But it's the same sort of thing, except in this case, it's got more dust than gas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so instead of just having a bunch of hydrogen gas floating around, it's mostly like little chunks of material, you know, things like carbon and silicon and ice all formed together. And the neat thing about this is this blue is, this is blue for the same reason our sky is blue. I don't know if you, I don't know if people out there know why the sky is blue. Oh, I think I used to know. <laughs> Can you give us a hint? Sure. Um, basically, what's happening is, or I can just tell you. Yeah, just, um, just tell you. <laughs> it's uh, um, particles in the atmosphere, things like the dust that's here, scatter light, scatter mm -hmm. sunlight. And it turns out blue light scatters more than red light. And so whenever you have the sun somewhere else in the sky, what you're actually seeing is sunlight scattered toward us by all the stuff in our atmosphere. Same thing here. You've got all these stars and their scattered light is what you were seeing. Oh, wow. So this, this is actually called a reflection nebula, you know, that's because that's, it's, it's scattering the light. Mm -hmm. So this is blue for the same reason our sky is blue. Wow. Interesting side note there. That is. We also see things like this. This, oh, is actually, this looks, this looks interesting. Um, looks like kind of Harry Pottery. I forget actually, what the ghosts are called. <laughs> Uh, the Dementors, yeah. Yes, the Dementors. That's what it kind of looks like, but it's so I, neat. Actually, you know, I never thought about that, but you're <laughs> absolutely right. I'm going to have to start calling it the Dementor Nebula. <laughs> the official name for it, though, is actually the Eagle Nebula. It looks kind of like an eagle with some wings here. I off did, the top. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people call it the Star Queen Nebula. That's another name for it. Um, but notice how this one, instead of being red or blue, it's actually dark. Mm -hmm. right? And so what you're seeing here is super, super, super thick clouds with lots of dust. And they're actually absorbing light behind them. That's what's making it dark, is they're really cold and really thick, um, kind of like you know, rain clouds. 
Um, same sort of thing we see here. Are all the nebulas within the Milky Way? Uh, not all of them, uh, all the ones I've shown you so far. Okay. okay. But, but we can definitely see these same sorts of things in other galaxies. Okay. Absolutely. Now, sometimes we see something like this. This is actually called B68. Um, it's the B stands for Barnard, who was an astronomer at Vanderbilt about 100 years or so ago. And this is a super dark, super dense cloud. In fact, it's so dark and so dense, you can't see the stars at all behind it. Uh, that's, this is actually a cloud in the foreground of all these stars in the background. Wow. Again, this is, this is again called a dark nebula. Mm -hmm. uh, William Herschel, the guy who discovered Uranus way, way back in the 1700s, called these holes in the heavens. Mm -hmm. We see these all over the place. Mm -hmm. And this is where stars are actually being born right now. Wow. These super dense, super cold places where gravity can take over and squish the cloud and make a star out of it. Wow. So a star, is, is it made out of all the different materials that are up there or Absolutely. You, are you going to get, are you going to get to that? Maybe I'm jumping ahead. No, no, no. I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit, but that's a great question. Um, okay. Yes, basically all these nebula, nebulae that I've been showing you, what's happening is that gas and that dust collapses under its own gravity and forms the star. Okay. So, huh. and, and that's a great point because as I mentioned earlier, sometimes stars explode and they'll throw things out into the galaxy, which can then form stars later. Okay. So stars that are being born now are actually being born from the debris from earlier generations of stars. Wow. Pretty neat stuff. Yeah. So e even our, our solar system was born, we think, uh, from one of these supernovae. Mm -hmm. So a supernova from an earlier star happened, created a shock wave, which then compressed the gas that formed our solar system later. Wow. So pretty neat pretty neat stuff. Mm -hmm. So here's something that every uh, PowerPoint pundit will tell you is a bad idea. Way too much text on a slide. <laughs> but this is going to be sort of my outline for stars and planets being formed. I'm going to go through it very quickly. Um, but again, in fact, you've mentioned this, we talked about this a second ago. The first thing that has to happen for stars to be born is gravitational collapse. So when we look at that, um, nebula that I showed you a minute ago, that B68, that hole in the heavens. We can look at that in detail. And what we see, this is kind of a contour map of density. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes, that makes sense, right? Um, mm -hmm. This is a little knot in the very center. And this knot right here is where a star will be born mm -hmm. in the future. It's in the process right now of collapsing to form a star. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can look very closely at these nebula and we see these. This one's actually a, a neat one because you can see another knot over here. Mm -hmm. So we actually think there's two separate clouds that are colliding with each other in this case. And perhaps that's what's causing the star to be formed, that shock wave. So first thing, of course, is again, gravitational collapse. Now, normally when these um, uh, clouds collapse, they're not gonna just form one star, they're gonna form a whole bunch, okay? And you can see here, this is the so-called Orion Nebula. And they've zoomed in on a bunch of little knots. These are, these are basically those same, like a picture of those, that same knot I showed you earlier, except now they're a little hotter, mm -hmm. so they, they're glowing, mm -hmm. right? And so this is the Orion Nebula. It's a very famous nebula. It's just south or below the belt of Orion. Mm -hmm. And these are all stars that are forming inside this nebula as it collapses. Stars and actually planets around them. Now, this word here, I, the reason I, I don't, didn't put a whole lot of words on the slides, but I wanted to put this one up here. These are called propylids which is short for proto or pre planetary disks. Okay. So these are disks in the process of forming planets. That's where the word comes from. So word of the day, maybe. Word of the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we get this fragmentation of the cloud as it collapses, and then eventually it will form a star cluster like this. Wow, that's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, so this is basically a, this is a rather large one, just a cluster of many, many stars, each one of them that formed from those uh, clumps as they collapsed and they get hotter and hotter and hotter and eventually they form a star. And the heat is not coming from the sun. It's coming from the star, right? Yes, that's right. This is all, um, you know, these stars are, are um, as the cloud collapses, it gets hotter. Okay. Right? That's, one of those things, and I think you might even learn in like chemistry or physical science, 
there's a relationship between volume, pressure, and temperature. So as you squeeze something, it actually gets hotter. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening here. Okay. Gravity is squeezing it and making it hotter and hotter. Okay. All right, now here's one cool thing about this. And I have a video. I don't know if we want to try to show it or not. What we could do is we could put it on online later. Okay, that'd be fine. Okay. Um, so as this thing is collapsing, again, think of a big knot that's getting smaller and smaller. It actually isn't going to just collapse straight down. It's actually going to flatten into a disc, right? Hmm. And actually, I'll put it, so here's a, here's a drawing. This is not a picture. This is a drawing of what that disc might look like as it collapses. I put a link to a video here on the PowerPoint. I can share this PowerPoint if you'd yeah, like. If you'll share the um, PowerPoint and our viewers can um, click on it after they watch the video, we'll put it in the, in the YouTube link. Perfect. Yeah. That'd be perfect. Yeah. Um, and really, all this video is showing is a figure skater. And you might think, what do figure skaters have to do with star formation? If you've ever watched a figure skater, they'll have their arms and legs out and they're rotating very slowly, what happens when they pull their arms and legs in? They go faster. Faster and faster and faster. That's exactly what happens as one of these clumps collapses. Mm -hmm. And as it spins faster and faster and faster, it'll actually flatten into a disc. Wow. Now the cool thing is, at the very center of this disc, that's your star. But in this outer part of the disc, that's where the planets form. Mm -hmm. okay? And so we see that in our own solar system. All of the planets in our solar system are in a flat disk. They're in that geometry. Mm -hmm. They're not just all over the place. They're in a very flat disk. Every single planetary system we've seen is in a flat disk. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the proof of, of where this is actually all coming from. Uh, another video, if, if people aren't completely bored out of their mind by this one, I could actually talk about how do we know all of this? That's one thing we don't have time. Yeah, well, that's maybe always a, Yeah, that, that's always a great thing in science is, I'm telling you all these things, you're like, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to have a rock in front of you or pour some chemicals together, right? But how do we know all this? And again, that might be a, a later video. Yeah, sure. All right. So basically, it collapses into this disk and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. That's what we're showing here. Eventually, you get a star. Okay. That's that little knot in the very center of that disk forms a star. This is actually the star called Albareo. It's a, it's a binary star system. And look at the different colors there. Yeah. Blue that, those and blue. Col yeah, it's beautiful. Those two colors are based on temperature. The blue one is much hotter than the, than the, uh, the red one. Because I, I think about fire, because the hotter the, a fire is, the bluer the color. Absolutely. That, that makes sense. Exactly the same thing that's going on here. So we got two stars at very, very different temperatures. But this is eventually what that, um, that knot is going to form in the very center is stars. Um, now, of course, it doesn't actually become a star until you get fusion in the core. Mm -hmm. That's when you start actually building up heavier and heavier elements. One cool side note is that pretty much every heavy element in the universe was made inside of a star. Wow. So, right here, I got my wedding ring right here made out of gold, right? At least I think, I hope it is. <laughs> I, I bought it. Is that gold actually comes from inside a star. Wow. Amazing. So, yeah. Basically, the carbon that makes up your body, the, the iron, the silicon, the gold, all of that comes from stars. Mm -hmm. So you might have heard the expression, we are stardust. Well, we yep. actually are stardust. Mm -hmm. We come from stars. Wow. So now in that disk, in addition to the star, there's that disk around. That's where you get planets. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the cool things is we've actually found planets all over the universe, right? So we, at first, we only knew about eight or nine, depending on what, how you feel about Pluto, right? right. Our system, that's a whole nother debate. Right. But now we've actually found thousands of planets all over the place, all, all around other stars. And here's just a, 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 some artist drawings, actually, of what they might look like. We don't have any direct pictures of them yet. Um, but we found all these just amazing planets, all of which maybe at some point in the future we could visit and maybe they have life on them. So once you get start getting planets. Now, this right here, here's another $20 word. Okay. Differential condensation. All that means is that you get more heavy stuff forming near the star and lighter stuff forming farther away from the star. Okay. So, probably, is it from, from the gravity? From Actually from heat, the heat from, from the heat? star itself. Yeah. So most of you or most people probably know that close to the sun, we have rocky planets like the earth. 
and farther from the sun, we have gas giants like Jupiter. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why. It's actually the sun's heat created this difference in the kinds of planets that we see. But we're still not at planets yet. We then got to basically take all those bits of gas and dust in the disk and start to stick them together, right? And this process, here's another big word for you, accretion. Accretion. Accretion, yes. It's basically things colliding and sticking together. That's all it, that's all it means. And it's almost like a snowball. I mean, you know, if you imagine a small snowball, sort of the, the cartoon version of it rolling downhill and getting bigger and bigger and bigger as the different particles stick together, that's basically what happens with planets. They collide, they stick together, they grow and grow and grow. So they start off with little bits of, of material and eventually grow into planets through collision. Now there's, again, there's two different kinds of planets that will form. There are the so-called gas or ice giants. Actually, Uranus and Neptune have been recategorized recently as ice giants. They're mostly ice and not gas. Oh. Um, but you get these gas giants, like here's a picture of Jupiter. And you want to talk beautiful. Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, I, I could stare at this for hours yeah. and just look at all the different worlds. What you're actually seeing are storms on the surface of Jupiter. Storms that are many, 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 some, some of which are many times bigger than the Earth, right? Just this crazy, just weather that you're seeing so all over if Jupiter. It, if these are storms, but it's, it's a gas, or is this ice or gas? Gas, it's a gas. gas? So what kind of storm, like, is it like thunderstorms that we're used to here in West Tennessee or wind storms or all it's, of it's, them? No, no, it's mostly hurricane-like storms. Whoa. So like vortex, yeah. Wow. Um, so what actually happens, if you don't mind me taking a second, sure. is you've got clouds moving in different directions at different speeds. Uh -huh. And just a, a good uh, thing for you to try sometime or any of the viewers to try, take a pen or a pencil and put it between your hands and then move your hands back and forth. Right? What happens to the pen? It's turning. It spins. That's yeah. exactly what's happening here. Demonstration. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. So these are actually spinning vor vortices of gas in, at the, in the um, atmosphere of Jupiter caused by winds moving at different speeds. So not quite the same thing as a hurricane, but pretty powerful stuff. So what causes um, Jupiter to have storms like this? Is it is it anything to do with gravity or do we know yet or? Yes, um, well, th there's several things. Um, one, Jupiter is actually pretty hot on the inside and that causes heat to rise. Mm -hmm. And when that heat rises, it'll spread out on the surface. Mm -hmm. And then that's spreading out, it's called the Coriolis effect. There's another one for you. $20. Um, that, cor <laughs> <laughs> that Coriolis effect is what causes the clouds to move at different speeds, okay. in different directions. And then when you get two clouds moving different speeds in different directions next to each other, that's when you get a vortex. Wow. That's what forms it. There's right. one vortex you might have heard of called the Great Red Spot. Yeah, you know, that's what I was about to bring up. Yep, that's, that's a gigantic vortex that has been there probably at least three or 400 years, if not longer. Why is it red? Um, just the chemical reactions in the cloud. Okay, and did it, does that stay in the same spot too? Or does that move? No, it, it moves around, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it, uh, not quite as fast as some of the other storms. <clears throat> I would highly encourage you guys. Um, there's a, a, a satellite called Juno, J-U-N-O, that's orbiting Jupiter right now and sending back pictures. Type in NASA Juno on Google and just look at all the absolutely fantastic, crazy awesome pictures. I'm going to have to do this after this interview. That's awesome. No, it's, it's again, hours and hours. Like, and they even got movies where you can see things swirling around. Oh, wow. So we get the gas giants. Of course, gas giants, the reason why they're gas giants is they actually captured hydrogen and helium gas, right? Here on the earth, we're not big enough to do that. We don't have enough gravity. And that's the reason why we don't have a whole bunch of helium in our atmosphere. And if you have a helium balloon, what happens to it? It goes up. So all the helium has escaped because our gravity is not strong enough. But Jupiter and Saturn and those can actually capture that and become absolutely enormous gaseous planets. Wow. Of course, then they can do all sorts of things like form rings, like here's the rings of Saturn. Uh, they have moons, like this is the moon Europa around Saturn. It actually has an ocean under its surface. Wow. So it's got this icy surface. What you're actually seeing here are ice flows. These oh. all these things. And there's a subsurface ocean. And it's not the only one. Europa, there's one called Ganymede, Titan that's around Saturn, Enceladus. Those are all, those all have um, subsurface oceans or liquids of some sort. 
So those are places where there might be things living right now. Incredible. So yeah, it's quite possible that there is life on other places in the solar system. Most of the time you think Mars, right? Whenever you think life, you think Mars. But in fact, icy moons with subsurface oceans are probably the most likely place to find it. Wow. Of course, that's the outer solar system. Inner solar system where we live, that's where you form the rocky planets. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture of Mercury, for example, from the MESSENGER mission. And if I were to just, just to show you this, you might think, oh, that's the moon, right? Uh, almost, I actually had that thought for a second. <laughs> yeah. Mercury and moon are very, are very, very similar. Now Mercury has more, it's heavy, it's got more density. It's because it's got more metals in the core, like iron and stuff. The moon has very little. Uh, but it's very similar, basically airless rocky planets with just craters all over the surface. Um, <clears throat> so, but still a really, really neat planet, lots of cool stuff. We've actually found ice on the poles of Mercury. Wow. People think, wait a minute, Mercury is super close to the sun. It's right, really hot. I'm right? thinking, should it be hot? <laughs> it, it's funny because the poles never receive direct sunlight. So they wow. never actually get enough heat for the ice to melt. Wow. Kind of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, once you start getting these rocky planets, eventually you get a crust forming on the outside, right? They'll be really hot at first. They'll form a crust, um, just like a pie, right? Um, then the material that, is, that makes up that planet will start to split, just like oil and water, mm -hmm. right? So you'll start getting the lighter stuff at the top. That's the rocks that we see all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then the heavy stuff, like the iron and nickel, will come down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why our core is made of iron and nickel and heavier metals is because it's sunk to the interior while the rocks have risen to the surface. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, some people might ask, well, we have iron and stuff here on the surface. Well, that's because of tectonics, right? We have volcanoes, we have earthquakes, we have all these plates that are moving around. Um, you know, get a geologist on, you might talk more about this. Um, but, we, but we have, again, we have all this volcanic activity which can dredge the stuff from the inside to the surface and give us those metals that we have. One other cool thing that people may not realize so you can see this right here, all these gases. Mm -hmm. This is where our atmosphere comes from. The air that you breathe, the reason why we have an atmosphere is volcanoes, right? Now, the gas that comes out of the volcanoes has been um, chemically adjusted over time mm -hmm. by life, by sunlight, but even by like comets hitting the surface and putting ice in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So it's not, basically the air you breathe is not the same air coming out of a volcano, but that's where it originally came from was from volcanoes. Neat. And, then, and then finally, once you get your atmosphere, once it cools down, you got your crust, then you can start forming your life. And of course, your whole tree of life from your original life forms all the way to what we see on the earth today. So basically, this is a long story, starting from the birth of a star, going all the way to us today, studying the birth of stars. Well, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Cruz, for uh, going through all of that with us and sharing the different photos and, and everything. So that was very interesting. Any questions you have before we finish? I'm trying to think. Um, we <laughs> I went over a lot at you there. Yeah, it was, my mind is like, woo, <laughs> exploding like a star. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about, because um, I've always heard back, you know, when I was in elementary, middle and high school, that stars, the light that we see is a dead star. Is that true? Um, no, that's actually not true. Okay. <laughs> um, basically, that could be true. I don't know if you can hear that. Can you hear that in the background? I can hear it a little bit, but that's okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Basically, the stars that you can see in the night sky are really close to us. Okay. And so you are correct, or whoever told you this is correct. You're actually seeing the stars in the past. But... Um, it's not so long ago that the star has died. Okay. So you're seeing stars that are like what they look like a thousand, at most like 10,000 years ago. Okay. okay. And stars live for millions, if not billions of years. So none, none of the stars that you can see when you look up at night are actually dead yet. Oh, wow. So, okay, I've got another one. Cause I remember when I was a little girl, I heard about Halley's Comet. Yes. And so does that, I think I heard that it comes around every 50 years or 70 years or something like that. Or did like I just 80, hear that? <laughs> no, no, it's more like 80 years. But 80? yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Um, we've actually recorded um, flybys of Halley's Comet all the way back into the BC times. Oh, wow. 
So have you ever heard of William the Conqueror, the guy who conquered England uh -huh, and, uh -huh. and took it over? Yeah. Actually, if you look at um, one of the tapestries that was made to commemorate his victory, you see a comet in one of the panels. And that was actually Halley's Comet. So what's the difference in, in you're saying it's Halley's Comet? Halley's mm -hmm. Comet. Oh, either way. Okay. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. You can say either What's one. the difference <laughs> in a comet and a, and a star? A comet is basically a chunk of ice and rock. Sometimes we refer to those as dirty snowballs, mm -hmm. basically, because that's kind of what they're like. Mm -hmm. And when they get close to the sun, that ice will actually vaporize and it will leave a tail going behind it. Okay. Um, so that, that's what a comet is. A star is like our sun. The okay. sun and stars are basically these gigantic, glowing, super hot balls of, of uh, gas that um, you actually have atoms fusing together in the center to make all this energy. Oh, wow. Well, that, big was, nuclear reactor. that was neat. Well, do you have anything else on your, um, on your slideshow you want to share with us? Uh, no, ma'am. I think that, that's probably enough for okay. one day. Well, perfect. If you want to stop sharing your screen and we'll put you back on the big screen, and then we'll just wrap up here. And uh, again, thank you for taking time today, Dr. Cruz, to teach us how stars are born. And um, thank you to all of our viewers for joining us today. We look forward to continuing our mission here at Discovery Park of inspiring children and adults to see beyond. For more educational resources, visit our website at discoveryparkofamerica.com slash education. See you later.